Hi, I'm Eliezer Cohen, an architect for Font Technologies at Microsoft. Today, I want to introduce you to font hinting techniques and their implementation in TrueType, the font technology shared by Apple and Microsoft. In my presentation, I shall first explain the basics. Then, we shall see some examples of working in TrueType. A block diagram will provide an overview of the whole TrueType stack machine. Then we shall discuss alternative approaches to font problems. Finally, we shall look into the production of hinted fonts. Today, most digital media are based on bitmap displays. In such media, fonts assume the form of bitmap characters before being displayed. This slide shows two bitmap characters. Both represent the letter Q in the font Times New Roman at size 12 points. Each square in these pictures corresponds to one bit in the stored data and to one pixel on the display medium. We define one point as one seventy-second of an inch. On the screen, we may have a resolution of 72 dots per inch. At this resolution, 12 points correspond to a font height of 12 pixels. On the printer, we have a resolution of 300 dots per inch. At this resolution, 12 points correspond to a font height of 50 pixels. Until recently, bitmap characters were the primary form to store digital fonts. They offer two big advantages, quality and speed. In bitmap fonts, every character bitmap is produced individually and can be tuned pixel by pixel to satisfy the highest quality requirements. The bitmap fonts are also the fastest to display. They are copied onto the display without any further rendering operation. The bitmap fonts also pose two major disadvantages, inflexibility and data size. A bitmap font can only be used for the resolution and the size it was designed for. A new display medium requires new fonts, so does any geometric transformation like a rotation by 15 degrees. Size is another problem. A 20-point font covering all ASCII characters for a printer with 600 dots per inch amounts to about 100 kilobytes. If we look at the various output media on the market, we notice a big variety of resolutions and marking technologies. Screens start at 72 dots per inch, and professional typesetters may go to more than 2,000 dots per inch. A host computer, which has to provide the bitmaps for its output devices, can easily end up with several gigabytes of font data, a very impractical situation. The solution to this problem is outline characters. Here, a character is stored with its outline, which is described as a sequence of control points, which are connected with lines and curves. The outline of a character is designed at a high resolution and scaled to the desired size before being displayed. When speaking of font heights, we usually refer to the M height. The M height is a hypothetical distance including both ascending characters like the lowercase l and descending characters like the lowercase g. A point size refers to the m height. Let us look again at the Times New Roman Q. Its outline was digitized on 2048 units on its m height. If we want to display this character with 12 pixels on the screen, we have to scale all the control point coordinates by the factor 12 divided by 2048. The printer with 300 dots per inch requires a scaling factor of 50 divided by 2048. We can also easily apply a rotation matrix to the control point coordinates in order to create rotated characters. Thus, Outline fonts solve the shortcomings of bitmap fonts. We store one outline per character and transform the control point coordinates to create any required size or shape. 
we have exchanged computation time with data size. Unfortunately, we also have some quality problems to tend to. Symmetry control is the most apparent problem when scaling control point coordinates on character outlines. Let us look at this age, which is shown along with the x coordinates of the major control points. In the digitized outline, the point 0 has the x coordinate of 161 design units. The points 11, 8, and 7 have the x coordinates 355, 1117, and 1311, respectively. We see that the two stems of the edge have the same thickness of 194 design units. When displaying this edge at 16 pixels per m, we have to scale these coordinates. x0 is scaled to 1.3, x11, x8, and x7 are scaled to 2.8, 8.7, and 10.2, respectively. On a monochrome digital medium, we cannot display fractions of a pixel. Therefore, these numbers are rounded when transferred to the display. After rounding these numbers, we see that the left stem is left with two pixels width, while the right stem is reduced to one pixel width. We started with an outline where the two stems had the same width but the bitmap after scaling has lost the symmetry. This creates unacceptable looks. The next problem is the preservation of similarity between character features. Let us look at this B. Its vertical stem on the left has the width of 167 design units in the digitized outline. Its round ball on the right the width of 184 design units. At 18 pixels per m, the stem is scaled to 1.47 pixels, which results in one pixel on the display. The ball is scaled down to 1.62 pixels, which round to two pixels. In the digitized outline, there is a difference of about 10% between the stem and the ball. In the bitmap, the ball is twice as thick as the stem. Again, a very ugly situation. At times, scaling to very small sizes can even render a text undecipherable. This is an example of times bold italic at 11 pixels per m. Color is defined as the even distribution of the ink across the display. Reading this Helvetica bold italic sample at 18 pixels per m, we notice how our eyes are distracted by the uneven color. Good type is type which you do not notice when reading. This example definitely does not fulfill the requirement of non-obtrusiveness. Outline fonts solve shortcomings of bitmap fonts, but simple scaling of control point coordinates causes severe quality problems. Hints are additional information added to the character descriptions in order to solve these problems. Hints result in operations which modify the scaled control point coordinates before the character outline is filled. The next section gives three examples of hinting in TrueType. We remember the symmetry problem we encountered when scaling the control point coordinates of the cap H. In the outline, the two stems of the cap H were of equal width, but due to rounding effects in the bitmap, one of the stems ended being two pixels wide, while the other was reduced to one pixel. Let us now discuss how we can solve this problem. We shall use the notation specified here. XSC will denote a scaled coordinate, 
XGR, it's grid fitted counterpart. That means the result after hinting. The symmetry problem is caused by rounding control point coordinates rather than distances. The solution to the problem is, of course, rounding distances rather than control point coordinates. In pseudocode, this means round the scaled x coordinate of point zero to find its grid fitted x coordinate. Then round the scaled distance between the points 0 and 11 and add it to the grid fitted coordinate for point 0. The result is the grid fitted x coordinate for point 11. Apply the same algorithm to points 8 and 7. After that, the distance between points 0 and 11 is equal to the distance between points 8 and 7. Due to the general nature of these operations, this equality will hold true for all scale factors and sizes. In true type, we have an assembly language with instructions which implement operations like the ones we have just discussed. These instructions are designed as operations on control points on the glyph outline. True type instructions move control points to desired positions. Let us see some examples. Move direct absolute point moves a point to the next grid boundary. Set vectors to coordinate axis x signals that the subsequent movements on control points will be carried out in the x direction. Set reference point designates a control point to become the reference point for the subsequent operations. Move direct relative point moves a control point until it assumes a distance from the reference point as defined by the unhinted outline. Align with reference point moves a control point such that it is aligned with the reference point. Interpolate untouched points interpolates untouched points, as the name indicates, between pairs of grid fitted control points. Let us now look how we solve the H with true type instructions. Set vectors to coordinate axis X means that the next instructions will work on the X coordinates of the control points. Move direct absolute point zero moves point zero in the x direction to the next grid boundary. This is equivalent to rounding the x coordinate of point zero. This instruction has also a side effect. It designates point zero to be the reference point for the subsequent operation. Move direct relative point 11 controls the distance from the reference point to point 11. This instruction rounds the distance between point 0 and point 11 and moves point 11 to the position reflecting that rounded distance. This corresponds to the operation we performed with our pseudocode a few minutes ago. Another pair of move direct absolute point and move direct relative point is applied to points 8 and 7. After this, the points 0, 11, 8, and 7 are said to be grid fitted. The distance between points 0 and 11 is equal to the distance between points 8 and 7. Due to the general nature of these operations, this equality will hold true for all scale factors and sizes. An important task in font hinting is diagonal control as part of providing an even color in a given text. Let us look again at an example with bad color. We see how dark and light patches distract our eyes while reading the text. This is due to a lack of control in the widths of diagonals. The next slide focuses on that point. On the text sample, we notice two shortcomings. 
the V is much fatter than the H, and the V itself is unsatisfactory due to its lack of symmetry. Both problems can be solved with proper diagonal control. In true type, we use two vectors called the projection and freedom vectors in order to apply diagonal control. The projection vector, as in projective geometry, is the vector along which a distance is measured. The freedom vector is the vector along which a point is moved until its projection on the projection vector assumes a required value. We start with the points A and B. A prime and B prime denote their projections on the projection vector. D1 is the distance between A and B as measured along the projection vector. Let us now assume that we want to increase this distance to D2 by moving B along the freedom vector. The point C reflects the position we have to move B2 in order to achieve this goal. The projection and freedom vectors are two of the most powerful tools in true type. The next slide shows how they are used in controlling the width of diagonals. The goal is to control the thickness of the diagonal stems in V. The first lines of true type code move the points 0, 1, 5, and 6 to the next grid intersections. After these points have been grid aligned, we start working on the inner points 2, 3, and 4. To control these inner points, we shall use the true type instruction move indirect relative point. This instruction moves a control point until it assumes a certain distance from the reference point as specified by an auxiliary table called the control value table. This table is necessary in order to coordinate between different character features over the whole font. All features referring to the same control value table entry will be controlled in the same way. In this example, we move points 2 and 3 such that the left stem acquires the desired width as stored in a control value table entry. The first instruction is set projection vector to line, which sets the projection vector perpendicular to a line passing to the control point 0 and 1. We then set the freedom vector parallel to the x-axis and designate point 1 to be the reference point. All of these operations prepare the state for the instruction move indirect relative point to work in. This instruction will move point 2 along the x-axis until its distance from the reference point equals the control value as measured on the projection vector. As a side effect of this instruction, the point 2 will become the new reference point. After that, point 3 is aligned with the reference point 2 2 on the projection vector. The effect is aligned through points 2 and 3, which is parallel to the line through point 0 and 1 at a distance specified by the control value. The next instruction, move indirect relative point, performs a similar operation on point 4. We set the projection vector perpendicular to the line through points 5 and 6. We designate point 5 to be the reference point, and we carry out the instruction move indirect relative point to point 4 using the same control value as on the left stem. Now comes point 3. Point 3 has to be moved such that it creates a right line parallel to points 5 and 6 without destroying parallelity of the left line to point 0 and 1. 
the solution consists of the following two lines in true type. At this stage, the projection vector is perpendicular to the line going through points 5 and 6. The point 4 has been designated to be the reference point. Set freedom vector to line now sets the freedom vector parallel to a line going through the points 2 and 3. All this sets the stage for the operation align with reference point which moves point 3 along the freedom vector until it aligns with point 4 as measured on the projection vector. Controlling diagonals with algorithms along these lines yields much better color across the font. The next slide shows the results with a font hinted with diagonal control. We see a much more even color across the display and the text is much easier to read. Spacing constitutes a quality criterion often neglected by type engineers. In fact, in the production of the Windows 3.1 core fonts, the control of the white spaces around the characters cost us more time than the control of the glyph shapes themselves. The next example focuses on the same problem in another font. We see a text sample with a badly spaced combination between the letters N and I. Looking at the letters N and I, we see the reason. N has one pixel left side bearing, this is the, the, the empty space on the left of the character, and two pixels right side bearing, this is the empty space on the right of the character, while the reverse is true for the I. As a consequence, the combination I-N ends with two pixels between the two letters, while the combination ni displays four pixels between the n and the i. In any text containing these frequent combinations, such a big difference in spacing causes interruptions in the word flow. See the example in the word containing above. The solution to this problem lies in the instruction move indirect relative point we are already familiar with. In true type, two control points are added to every glyph outline, one each for the left and right side bearing point. The left side bearing point is the point at the left of a character and the right side bearing point is the point at the right of the character. We can use these points to hint the left and right side bearing distances like any other width within the character. This slide shows the control values we would use in connection with the instruction move indirect relative point. Using the same control value entry 1 for the side bearings on the N and on the I will ensure an even spacing between these two letters in any combination. Unfortunately, this desired effect comes with a price. With each instruction move indirect relative point is associated a rounding error which can accumulate across a chain like the one we see on the eye. At small resolutions, every pixel counts. The advanced width denotes as the space around the character which includes the shape as well as the left and right side bearing. What do we do if at a certain size we have an eye which has to be displayed on four pixels advance width and one pixel stem width? There is no way to distribute three pixels evenly between the side bearings. There are two ways to address the problem. We can maintain the advance width at the cost of asymmetrical side bearings and bad spacing at this size. or we can modify the advance width of the eye at this size in order to achieve symmetry between the side bearings. In this latter case, we have to face problems with Visivig issues in a word processor using this font. We notice that there is no ideal solution to spacing problems in a font. In fact, a well-hinted font is a font in which careful compromises have been made on a case-by-case -case basis for every character. 
Both diagonal and spacing control are highlights of true type which are not available in other hinting technologies. They considerably contribute to the high quality one can achieve by hinting in true type. Herewith, we conclude our examples in true type hinting. Let us now take a step back and look at the overall structure of the true type interpreter which scales the control point coordinates and executes the hints. The true type interpreter is designed as a stack machine. This slide gives an overview of the true type stack machine. It has been simplified slightly for better comprehension. The engine is the heart of the interpreter and the only processing unit in the system. In true type, every glyph outline is accompanied by a sequence of true type instructions. Called the glyph program, these true type instructions constitute all of the hints for this glyph. The interpreter engine receives these hints as input and performs as output modifications of the glyph outline or more precisely, of the coordinates of the control points comprising the outline. The operand stack is an integral part of every stack machine. Every true type instruction works within a graphic state. The projection and freedom vectors and the reference point we mentioned earlier are examples for the graphic state variables. True type is an assembly language for font hinting. As such, it also offers a mechanism to declare and use subroutines in the glyph programs. Diagonal control algorithms are good examples for true type subroutines. Serifs, we see an example on the hand behind me, are little terminals at the end of horizontal and vertical stems. Serifs also lend themselves to being hinted with subroutines. Several true type instructions like move indirect relative point use a control value table as an input operand. The control value table is the major vehicle which allows the control of individual character features in a way global to the whole font. It is the control value table which makes an aesthetically harmonious font out of a collection of unrelated glyphs. When executing glyph programs, the control value table constitutes an input to the interpreter engine. We have also mentioned that a pre-program is used to calculate the values in the control value table. Like any glyph program, the pre-program is a collection of true type instructions which are carried out by the same interpreter engine. The pre-program is part of a true type font and is executed once the size is determined and prior to any glyph program. With a few negligible exceptions, this diagram represents the true type interpreter. The true type instruction set consists of operations on the various components on this diagram. The major instructions like move indirect relative point and align with reference point work on the control point coordinates. There are also instructions setting the graphic state, pushing and popping values on and from the operand stack, arithmetic and logical operations working on the stack, and finally operations reading and writing control values. This diagram also illustrate the major advantage of the hinting technology in true type, the flexibility. Due to its nature as an assembly language, true type offers an open platform to express any hinting technology which works on outlines. True type has already been used to hint a big variety of fonts which are as diverse as text faces, and handwriting like script faces in European languages, as well as Hebrew, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Arabic typefaces. This flexibility is the hallmark of true type.
let us now look at alternative approaches to font problems. The next block diagram gives an overview of the steps performed when rasterizing a hinted character outline. A rasterizer for hinted fonts consists of two parts, the interpreter and the scan converter. In the interpreter, the character outline is scaled by applying a transformation matrix to the coordinates of the control point. After that, as we have seen, hints are used to modify these scaled values. The result is a hinted outline, also called a grid-fitted outline. The scan converter is the component which fills the outline with ink. It starts by applying some smoothing algorithms to the hinted outline. After that, the outline is filled to create a bitmap. Finally, this bitmap is corrected for problems like dropouts. Dropouts denote very thin parts in the outline which break apart in the bitmap. Font technologies may differ in three topics. The outline description, the hinting techniques, and the scan conversion paradigms. There are two categorically different ways to digitize letter shapes, skeletons and outlines. Metafont, Don Knut's pioneering system for digital typography, was based on digitizing a skeleton, a medial line within a letter shape. Outline digitization dominates in today's systems. TrueType is based on outlines which have proven to be the easier technique for font production and hinting. Outline systems differ in the curve forms they use to describe the outlines of letter shapes. Icarus, another pioneering system in digital typography, is based on circular arcs. Adobe's Type 1 technology uses cubic Bezier splines. TrueType has been developed with second order B splines. Every one of these curve forms has slight advantages in the one or the other aspect. In terms of final quality, they all behave similarly well. In terms of hinting techniques, font technologies can be divided into two categories, declarative hinting and procedural hinting. Aqua Graphics in Telefont and Adobe's Type 1 are examples for a declarative system. In Adobe's Type 1, the designer specifies a set of guiding lines which delimit character features. The character in this slide shows a set of such lines which surround stems, serifs, and round balls. The interpreter in the Type 1 rasterizer takes these guiding lines and uses them to create the best possible character bitmap at any given size. TrueType and Folio used by Sun Microsystems are examples for a procedural hinting system. In these systems, the designer specifies exactly what every control point will do for any given size. The interpreter is nothing but an executor of the instructions in the glyph program. We notice the difference between the two categories. In declarative systems, the designer specifies the guiding lines without knowing in detail how the interpreter will use the information. In declarative systems, the intelligence is in the interpreter, which has to put the guiding lines to the best use possible. In procedural systems, the designer has to control every detail of control point movements. In procedural systems, the intelligence is in the fonts. Comparing the two categories, we can conclude that procedural systems offer the better potential to achieve high quality bitmaps at any given size. The challenge is to use this potential. In a few minutes, we shall discuss the production methods for true type fonts. Scan conversion is the third topic where font technologies may differ from one another. 
It denotes the process which takes a grid fitted outline as input and delivers a character bitmap as output. Outline smoothing, filling, and dropout control are the three steps of the scan conversion process. Every font technology defines its own paradigms for these steps. TrueType does not perform any outline smoothing. When it comes to filling, TrueType fills a pixel with ink if the center of that pixel lies within the grid fitted outline. TrueType has also a clearly defined dropout control algorithm, which is explained in the TrueType manual. Other font technologies differ in their definitions of a black pixel. Some techniques calculate the area of a pixel covered by the outline and make a black-white decision based on the gray value of that pixel. Others may even use filtering techniques to adjust the output for a low bandwidth output device like a TV screen. An evaluation of scan conversion techniques has to be performed within the environment the bitmaps are intended for. For monochrome displays, the simple rules defined by TrueType have proven to be fully satisfactory. For applications like TV screens, an additional layer on top of TrueType can be designed to handle grayscale issues. The next slide describes the methods to produce TrueType fonts. When producing a true type font, the designer has to specify the outlines and the glyph programs. That means the hints on the outline. There are two ways to produce a true type outline. An interactive editor can be used to digitize letter shapes from scratch. This method has the potential for the most compact outline data. It is also the appropriate method for individuals who want to create special purpose characters like company logos. The professional font foundries, on the other hand, will prefer a different method. They already have vast libraries of digitized fonts for one of the earlier systems in digital typography. In these cases, Curve conversion and curve fitting techniques can be used to automatically translate any outline format into TrueType. Curve conversion is the process where every curve in the source font is translated into one or more TrueType curves. Curve fitting, on the other hand, denotes the process of finding the best collection of TrueType curves producing a given shape. The result of the outline production is an uh, unhinted TrueType outline. The next step is the production of hints for which we can follow one of several methods. An interactive editor can be used to hint the outlines from scratch with TrueType instructions. This method has the potential for the fastest and most compact hint data, but it also poses the highest danger to drive into madness any typographer working on the production line. The process of hinting requires knowledge in two topics, typography and engineering. Typography is an art and a craft, which typographers learn in many years of training. Hinting should be performed by people who have run through this training. On the other hand, typographers are not engineers. Any attempt asking a typographer to program in TrueType assembly instructions is doomed to fail. We have to offer better tools than the basic TrueType assembly language. The solution is a high-level language which is used to describe character features in terms familiar to a typographer. Such a language provides commands for stems round balls, serifs, and diagonals. An interactive editor can be used by a typographer to define a character construction in terms of such building blocks rather than move indirect relative point instructions. After that, a compiler is used to produce the low-level true type code, 
which is available for any eventual fine tuning. An auto hinter is a program which analyzes glyph outlines, tries to recognize character features, and produces a description of the glyph program in terms of building blocks familiar to a typographer. In many production sites, the auto hinter is compiled into true type and shipped and used as is. On the other hand, the quality which can be achieved for screen fonts by state-of-the-art auto hinters is still mediocre. To achieve higher quality, a typographer must interactively correct the high-level character descriptions produced by the auto hinter. The core fonts in Microsoft Windows 3.1 were produced by this methodology. An alternative technique is also available for type foundries which have a library of fonts already hinted in another technology. In this case, a compiler is written to convert the source hints into TrueType. This type of compilation is enabled by TrueType's nature as an assembly language for font hinting. Such a compilation aims at reproducing in TrueType the bitmap images as created in the source system, which is usually a declarative font technology. True type fonts resulting from hint compilation reproduce the quality of the declarative font technology. Should the designer want to improve this quality, he can use an interactive true type editor to gain the full power of true type. The core fonts in Microsoft Japanese and Chinese Windows were produced by this methodology. The next slide sums up the conclusions we collected while working with various font technologies and TrueType itself. TrueType is a powerful assembly language for font hinting. TrueType is a procedural programming language which can be used to express any outline-based hinting technique, including declarative ones. Due to its nature as a programming language, TrueType offers unmatched potential for a font designer to achieve any aesthetic quality he wants. On the other hand, TrueType poses a challenge to develop the proper tools to enable the font production to be performed by typographers rather than engineers. The best way to produce highest quality true type fonts is to first hint the letter shapes in a high level language and then to compile these descriptions into true type. The ideal high level language should be procedural and offer a rich and powerful set of commands which reflect typographic concepts like stems, serifs, and diagonals. These concepts should also match the requirements of the script at hand. Roman typography works with different building blocks than Japanese typography. Working with such a methodology, there is no limit to the quality one can achieve for bitmaps produced by TrueType. The core fonts produced for Microsoft Windows 3.1 are evidence of this. I thank you for your attention and wish you much fun in your true type font production, which I'm sure you are starting right away. <laughs>